So I would like to start and begin the GSID a Taneoki Hei Memorial Lecture. I would like to show in, in a Taneoki Memorial uh, Taneoki Hei in a, in a slide, and please. Um, one of the slides. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, the Taneoki Hei Memorial, Memorial Award was established through uh, the contributions from dermatologists from Okayama University. In honor of the late uh, Kihei Taniyoku, uh, pro Professor Emeritus in, in Okayama University, uh, Professor Taniyoku was one of the and founder of JSID. This award is presented every year at the JSID annual meeting or the IID to domestic or, or foreign researchers who has made a noteworthy lifetime achievement in dermatology or closely related research field. Joining the previous notable awardees, this year's winner of the prestigious award is Professor John Krutman from IUF, Lebnik Research Institute for Environmental Medicine. He is a, the 24th award recipient. Uh, Professor John Krutman's work focuses on the dermatotoxicology, immunodermatology, and the photobiology and photodermatology, with a special emphasis on the environmental induced skin diseases and the skin aging. His specific and uh, scientific uh, contribution include the development of UV1 phototherapy and the discovery of the that infrared A radiation, the air pollution, contribute to skin aging. And the discovery of the, and that the uh, aryl hydrocarbon receptor is involved in skin stress responses, including photocarcinogenesis. Uh, Professor John Krutma is the chair of environmental medicine at the medical faculty of Heinrich Han University, Düsseldorf, and the director of the IEF. His lecture is titled and environmental skin. Please extend a warm welcome to Professor John Krutman, please. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Professor Morita, for the uh, very kind introduction. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, the Japanese Society for Investigative Dermatology for granting me with the honor and the privilege to deliver this year's Taniyoku Kihei Memorial Lecture. Um, the topic of my lecture is environment and skin. The skin, similar to the lung and the gut, is an interface organ, and thus it is permanently being exposed to environmental factors which alter, which shape, and which influence its biological activities. And this is not only important for skin health, but also for skin aging and for the pathogenesis of skin disease. And I would like to illustrate this by giving you three examples. Actually, the first one um, will focus on an environmental factor that has been studied for decades, its ultraviolet radiation. The second example will um, be about a factor that has more recently been recognized as posing uh, a threat to human uh, skin, that is air pollution. Uh, and in the third example, I would like to discuss with you some of the emerging evidence that environmental factors uh, actually interact with each other uh, and uh, thereby um, also affect the biological activity of skin. So let's start with ultraviolet radiation and I would like to share with you some uh, results from our laboratory uh, where we focused on the pathogenesis of cocaine syndrome which as most of you may know is a rare multi-system disorder caused by mutations in the CSB gene and the vast majority uh, of the patients of the CSA gene. There is currently no cure available. It's a progeroid syndrome, so the mean life expectancy is around 13 years. Um, the patients show growth retardation, progressive neurodevelopmental abnormalities, and as the skin cocaine syndrome manifests with UV hypersensitivity, and most important with a loss of subcutaneous fat, which is one of the clinical hallmarks of premature aging. 
If you look in textbooks, then cocaine syndrome is usually listed as a nucleotide ex uh, excision repair deficiency syndrome. However, when you reconcile all these different clinical symptoms that I just alluded to in the previous slide, I think you will agree that some of the symptoms are difficult to explain if you simply look at CSB as a DNA repair deficiency problem, and this prompted us and others to speculate that CSB serves biological functions beyond its role in uh, DNA repair. And in keeping with this, we um, recently observed that the CSB protein is not only present in the nucleus, which would be consistent with its role in DNA repair, but can also be found uh, at the centrosome. And this is some of the evidence. These are primary human skin fibroblasts, which are CSB proficient. And you can see here in this double staining for CSB and dinein that indeed the CSB protein localizes at the centrosome. And it is here where it can interact with proteins which are important for regulating protein acetylation, such as HDEX6 or MAC17, which is an acetyl transferase. Um, and again here, some of the evidence, uh, again in uh, primary skin fibroblasts on the left side, you see the proximity ligation assays, CSB HDX6, CSB MAX17, and in the double stainings, you can see that this interaction does not exclusively, but to a large extent, clearly occurs um, at the centrosome which prompted us to speculate that cytoskeletal proteins such as microtubuli, in particular alpha tubulin, might show an altered acetylation pattern uh, in situations which are characterized by CSB deficiency, and this is indeed the case. Um, again, here on the left side, you see primary uh, human skin fibroblasts from a healthy donor, and on the right side, from a patient with uh, CSB, and you can easily see, in particular, after UVA radiation, there is a strong increase in uh, alpha tubulin acetylation in the normal cells, um, and this completely um, does not occur in the CS1AN cells. Um, alpha tubulin acetylation is very important for autophagy, and it was thus no surprise to see that in CSB deficiency there is also disturbed autophagy. On the left side, again, fibroblasts. You can see, for example, that there is a, a market accumulation of P62. Actually, we found that there is a block in autophagic flux in these cells, and this is not specific for humans. We also see it in, uh, in other species, for example, in CSB deficiency elegans. Um, and we can also detect this in a third species in mice. Um, at the organ level, um, and this is the, the skin phenotype of chronically UVA-radiated hairless CSB-deficient mice, and if you just focus on the red box on the left side, you see um, the uh, phenotype of uh, normal uh, wild-type mice, uh, mice after UVA radiation and on the right side of CSB-deficient mice, and you will appreciate that there uh, has been the development of skin fibrosis and at the same time a complete loss of subcutaneous fat, and this goes along with an accumulation of P62, as is shown in the lower line, uh, but also of ubiquitin, and then there is their apparent uh, expression of cytokine genes, but also of genes which are involved in collagen de novo synthesis. So these observations would be consistent with the situation in which um, um, CSB is important in regulating protein acetylation and that in situations where CSB is deficient, then protein acetylation is being decreased. So we thought to target this by tipping the balance between uh, HDEX and acetyl transferases uh, by using HDEX inhibitors. Um, and the HDEX inhibitor that we have chosen for the uh, subsequent experiments is SAHA. Uh, SAHA is a pan-HDEX inhibitor, and we were interested in this drug because it is an FDA-approved drug, and we found that it can be uh, used to improve acetylation of alpha-tubulin uh, and also autophagy in CSB deficiency. That is again shown here for fibroblasts. You see that uh, in the CS1AN cells, uh, there is almost a complete lack of, of, of alpha-tubulin acetylation, and this can be nicely overcome if we treat the cells with Saha. And in the middle row, you see that this is associated uh, with a complete decrease of P62, acetyl uh, of, uh, P62 accumulation in these cells, indicating that 
that we can normalize uh, the autophagic flux. Um, and this is of clinical or therapeutical relevance because um, the HDEC inhibitor Saha was also very efficient in rescuing the skin phenotype of CSP deficient mice. Um, and you can nicely see this again in the red box on the left side. You have the CSB deficient mice that have not been treated. Uh, you see the complete loss of subcutaneous fat. And on the right side, you see uh, that this uh, loss of subcutaneous fat can be prevented if we orally administer Saha in the drinking water to these mice. And this is again associated then with the prevention of ubiquitin and P62 accumulation and with the normalizing, normalization of the apparent gene expression pattern that we previously have observed. So if we put all this together, then I think we have um, generated evidence in three different species, in human fibroblasts, in mice, and in C. elegans, that CSB has an important role in regulating protein acetylation and autophagy, um, and uh, this indicates uh, actually a paradigm shift uh, uh, as it concerns our understanding of the biological activity of this nucleotide excision repair protein. Um, and um, probably this concept is also of relevance for other um, nucleotide excision repair proteins, and I would like to share with you uh, very briefly at least uh, one other example, and that is XPA, which similar to CSB as we have previously shown, is also not only present in the nucleus, but can also be found at the centrosome, and importantly also within mitochondria. And it is here where it can interact uh, with an ATPase, and in XPA deficiency, you will actually find that mitochondria have a disturbance in uh, energy metabolism, and this gives actually rise uh, to the generation of what is called a senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or SASP, um, and uh, some of these proteins that are being secreted by XPA deficient cells actually have already been shown, for example, by Shikaku Nishiguri from Kobe to be relevant for photocarcinogenesis in XPA mouse models. And we now also have evidence that uh, the production or the, 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 uh, the development of this subsasp is also of pathogenetic relevance for, a, for the neurodegenerative phenotype that one can observe in XPA deficiency. And I would like to use the opportunity to advertise the oral presentation by my postdoc, Mark Mayora, who will present these data on Saturday afternoon in the concurrent mini symposium uh, on photobiology. Um, the second example I would like to talk about is the emerging evidence that air pollution is detrimental to human health. Actually, um, be before I talk about air pollution, I'd just like to remind you, um, because you're not environmental medicine people but dermatologists, that the American EPA classified pollutants into six distinct categories, but for the sake of this presentation, I will exclusively talk about particulate matter, or PM. Um, which is, of course, an environmental threat in large urban agglomerations all over the planet. Uh, this is just to remind you that it is not a problem which is exclusive to uh, large cities in the northwestern part of China, but it is also a big problem in the United States and in many European cities. So the first evidence that there might be a link between uh, airborne particle exposure and skin came actually from this um, epidemiological study that we published in 2010. And the, min the major finding was that chronic exposure to traffic-related air pollution is associated with more facial lentiginous. And uh, since that time, uh, we have been able to uh, corroborate and to extend this finding uh, in uh, a number of uh, other studies. Uh, a vast majority of these studies was actually conducted in China in, co in collaboration with Sijia Wang and Li Jin at Fudan University. Um, and I can also say that uh, this finding has been confirmed by other investigators in independent studies. However, all this evidence is epidemiological in nature, and, and epidemiological studies can only describe associations, and this does not necessarily mean that indeed there is a cause-effect relationship. Um, and we therefore asked whether there is also mechanistic evidence that would support this link. And to this end, we have recently developed an ex vivo human skin model in which we topically treat human skin um, with standardized diesel exhaust particle extracts 
uh, at very low concentrations, but repetitively in, an, in, 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 in the attempt to uh, mimic chronic exposure. Uh, and we then were, were first interested whether this would change skin color. Um, and uh, the answer is yes. You can already see this on the left side uh, by bold eyes. You see that after two and even more so after three topical applications of diesel exhaust particles, the ex vivo skin models um, start to um, look darker. Uh, of course, this can be quantified by chromometry, as is shown on the right side. And this is indeed due to melanin, uh, to an increase in melanin. On the left upper part, you see the total melanin content, and you can see that this is significantly being upregulated after diesel exhaust particle treatments after nine days. You can also see it in the Fontana Masson staining at the bottom. Uh, on the left side, the untreated skin models. On the right side, the diesel exhaust particle treated models. And you see the increase in melanin. Uh, and if we look at gene expression, we found a lot of genes which are in one way or the other involved in melanin de novo synthesis being uh, transcriptionally uh, upregulated. This is ex vivo, but what about in vivo evidence? Um, and uh, we also. Um, succeeded in developing an in vivo protocol in which we um, are able to topically apply by using fin chambers uh, diesel exhaust particles, again at very low concentrations, actually lower than what you have in your lungs, uh, topically to human skin. Um, and then again, we looked for changes in skin color. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, again, there is a darkening of skin color. And in some of these volunteers, we were also able to obtain punch biopsies, and when we uh, RT-PCR these, then you can see that we see a transcriptional expression pattern which uh, merely reflects uh, what we have also seen in the ex vivo skin models. So if we now take everything together, um, the epidemiological evidence and the mechanistic evidence, then I think one can conclude uh, that air pollution, in particular exposure to traffic-related particulate matters such as diesel exhaust particles, can modulate, can increase skin pigmentation. And interestingly, this is not specific for human skin. Um, in September 2017, Science News titled Polluted Water, it's where sea snakes wear black. And of course, this raises the question, what is the, the biological advantage that this uh, dark sea snake, who is now very visible in front of the, the corals, uh, has uh, when it is upregulating skin melanin content? And in the corresponding current biology paper, uh, the authors provided um, evidence that um, the increase in skin melanin actually serves to bind pollutant associated trace metals which are then bound to, uh, to, the to the melanin and can then be secreted by the snakes when they are shedding their skin. They also showed actually that uh, the sloughing frequency is being increased in the snakes that live in the polluted waters. We still don't know whether the same also uh, holds for human skin. We are looking at this, but we also think that there might be an alternative explanation given the fact that human melanin has antioxidative pro properties. So one could speculate that by increasing melanin content, um, the skin is preparing to uh, reduce uh, detrimental effects which might be caused by oxidative stress responses which are elicited by uh, air pollutants. And in, in, uh, in support of this, we actually recently found that in our in vivo model, the topical application of diesel exhaust particles can deplete antioxidants from the stratum corneum. Um, and in our ex vivo model, we see that diesel exhaust particles causes lipid peroxidation. And most importantly, when we pretreat the ex vivo human skin models with an antioxidant containing cosmetic product, then we can significantly reduce diesel, ex uh, diesel exhaust particle induced skin pigmentation. Again, on the left side, you can already see this uh, with bold eyes. And on the right side, uh, this can also, of course, be shown uh, by chromometry. Um, in the third example, I would now like to talk about a, a relatively new, new topic that is coming up in environmental, environmental medicine in general uh, and uh, as it concerns skin uh, in particular, uh, and that is the interaction of different environmental factors. So uh, what we are now talking about, uh, you can also call skin exposome, and it was actually last year that Thierry Passeron from Nice and I published in the Journal of Dermatological Science um, 
uh, a definition um, of the skin exposome, in this case specifically the skin ex aging exposome, which reads as follows. The skin aging exposome consists of external and internal factors and their interactions affecting a human individual from conception to death, as well as the response of the human body to these factors that lead to biological and clinical signs of skin aging. And in this figure, we also proposed uh, the environmental factors which are part of the skin aging ex exposome. Uh, and uh, you can see, of course, that um, sun radiation is here a very prominent one. Uh, but you also see that in this figure, uh, I already indicated uh, that sun exposure uh, already consists of several different wavelength ranges, ultraviolet radiation, visible light, infrared radiation, and if we are honest, we, we, we merely know anything about the interaction of these different wavelength ranges because histor historically photobiological and photodermatological studies have always been conducted in a way that rodent or human skin or uh, in vitro skin cells have been exposed either to UVB or to UVA or IRA a lot in our laboratory or now very trendy visible light and then uh, people are looking at, at biological endpoints and this is completely ignoring the possibility that these wavelength ranges might interact with each, uh, each other and if you look carefully in the literature there is some evidence that for, for this interaction, for example, there are studies that use sequential irradiation protocols, for example, first irradiating with UVB, then irradiating with IRA, and guess what? They were getting a third response, which was different from the UVB response or from the IRA response. And to make things even more complicated, when they changed the sequence of irradiation, and for example, first IRA irradiated and then UVB irradiated, they were looking at a fourth response, which also tells you that sequential irradiation protocols are probably not such a great idea if you want to understand what is really happening if you talk about uh, natural sunlight because they are just giving you another level of uh, artifacts. So um, this prompted us to hypothesize that during human evolution, uh, the skin is permanently exposed to the complete sunlight spectrum which consists of UVB, of UVA, of visible light and of infrared radiation and it is therefore very likely that human skin cells have developed elaborate molecular defense strategies in order to respond to solar radiation stress that go beyond a mere additive effect of the single components. Uh, and you can also see that we published this hypothesis already in 2005, but it took us until very recently to really address this because it requires a special irradiation source, uh, which we now have managed to build, which allows us simultaneous exposure of skin cells or, or rodent or human skin to UVB, to UVA, to visible light, to infrared at physiologically relevant doses at physiologically relevant ratios and at the same time by avoiding cross cont contaminations between the different wavelengths. So now we can do uh, the desired experiments. This is the emission spectrum which nicely fits that of natural sunlight and we have been using this lamp now to either irradiate with a combination of all four wavelength ranges or selected combinations or just single uh, combinations and in the data I will be showing you uh, we have used these doses and a ratio of UVA to UVB of 43, which is physiological relevant. And we, we simply started by looking at keratinocyte apoptosis. So this is just an annexin-5 staining. These are sham irradiated cells. These are UVB irradiated cells. Of course, we see uh, induction of keratinocyte apoptosis. This is UVA radiation. It does not induce keratinocyte apoptosis. And if we now perform a, com a simultaneous exposure to UVB and UVA, we surprisingly see that the UVB radiation induced apoptosis is being decreased and this effect maintains when we now uh, add infrared radiation or visible light. And this decrease uh, uh, in uh, UVB radiation induced keratinocyte apoptosis uh, 
by adding the other wavelengths is highly significant after 24 and 48 hours. We also see that the protein level, so this is caspase 3 cleavage, you can see in the uh, UVB radiated cells there is caspase 3 cleavage and this is almost completely abrogated if we add the other wavelength areas. The same for uh, caspase 8 cleavage and we do not see it for caspase 9 cleavage which would be consistent with the assumption that the interference of UVA radiation with the UVB radiation in your signaling pathway mainly affects what is called the extrinsic uh, part of um, keratinocyte apoptosis. And in, in, the, in the poster 1155, which will be presented by my postdoc, uh, Kevin Sondenheimer, you can see uh, first evidence that the point of interference most likely is at the level of the keratinocyte cell membrane. We have also recently started to look at the interaction of air pollutants with um, sunny radiation because when we are out there walking around, we are simultaneously exposed to both. Um, and uh, this is actually a poster presented by uh, Dr. Tamara Shikowski, who is heading our epidemiology group at IOF. Um, and what she found is really that this interaction is quite complex. Um, we found that, first of all, uh, the association between chronic exposure to ultraviolet, ra uh, ultraviolet radiation and the manifestation of skin aging traits is actually uh, being weakened significantly uh, if, the, uh, if the humans are chronically being exposed to particulate matter. Uh, I think this is still kind of plausible, so you could make the point that if, when you have a lot of particles in the troposphere, the ultraviolet rays are being reflected or absorbed. Um, but what, what was really surprising is, is that we see this interaction also vice versa, and that is uh, the association between uh, chronic exposure to particulate matter and skin aging traits is also weakened if uh, individuals are being exposed to uh, high doses, chronically being exposed to high doses of ultraviolet radiation. And this is much more difficult to explain, but it indicates that there is an interaction which can at least theoretically occur at two levels, at the level of the skin. Uh, so one can speculate that maybe irradiated human skin responds differently to particulate matter as compared to unirradiated skin. But for sure it can also uh, happen at the level of the troposphere, so ultraviolet rays. Uh, can photochemically modify particles, and these modified particles might then uh, exert biological effects uh, which are different from unmodified particles onto human skin. So I hope with these three examples, I've shown you that environmental dermatology is a very interesting and fascinating area to be in. Um, actually, we, we, we will actively recruit new postdocs in the second half of this year, so if you're interested in joining IOF, just uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I would like to close by um, thanking my collaborators, the members of my laboratory, uh, the, the, the labs within IOF that we are closely collaborating with, uh, and of course our collaborators outside of IOF. Uh, I would like to thank once more the Japanese Society for, inviting, uh, for Investigative Dermatology for providing me with this uh, opportunity. Um, and I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, and a wonderful talk. And I'd like to and, uh, thank you very much and on behalf of JSID. Okay. <laughs>